dear God, thank you for giving me life. Thank you for giving me purpose. Thank you for giving me my gifts and talents. Dear God, today I pray for my children. Will you protect them from the peer pressures of this world? Help them to resist temptation. Give them a heart that follows after you. Dear God, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for my family and friends. I pray for you to help me grow closer to you and grow stronger in my faith. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you give me wisdom so that I could continue to lead my family. Father, forgive me from the mistakes I have made. Lord, help me not to doubt you, but to look to you for comfort when things are hard. Lord, I thank you for everything you do and always loving me no matter what I do. I pray that you give me the courage and the strength. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name. In your name. Amen. Amen. Happy Mother's Day. It is wonderful that you could be here at the Source Church this morning. And for those who are on social media, uh, we're happy that you can join us on this wonderful Mother's Day. Even though it's a little rainy outside, it's a little sunshine inside. I um, wanted to do something special today, and I wanted to really dress up for Mother's Day. So I got my suits out, and, and something strange happened. It must be because of the air conditioning within our apartment, but none of them fit. So... I didn't get quite as dressed up as what I hoped for, but uh, we're still going to have a, a wonderful time together this morning. I have a question that I would like to ask you this morning. Actually, I have a question for the people who run the show here. Could I have the lights on? I usually like to see people when I uh, talk with them. But I have a question for all the moms this morning. One question. If your adult son were to tell you that he loves you, what would that sound like? If your adult son tells you that he loves you, what would that sound like? And for those who have young children, try to imagine a little bit what might your son say to you when he grows older and is an adult child, how would he express to you how much he loves you? I want you to think about that a little bit. And I see a, a bunch of smiles this morning. Well, I want to tell you a little story this morning. I have an opportunity to be able to work with inmates, so therefore I always have stories to tell when I preach on Sunday morning. But I had an inmate come into my office, and he had not talked to his mother for a long, long time. In fact, the last time that he spoke with her, he threatened to kill her. So he heard rumors that his mother wasn't doing very well. So he came into my office and he said, please, can I make that phone call? See, inmates don't have the luxury of making phone calls uh, out to family unless it goes through a whole bunch of procedures. But on that, that morning, I thought, I'm going to give him a phone call so he can speak with his mother. So he dialed the number and he talked to his mother and he found out that his mother was dying from cancer. He is an adult child. She is in her late 70s. And this is most likely going to be the last time that he'll ever be able to express himself to his mother. And I know that he has been struggling for a long period of time in the manner in which he had left his mother before he came into prison. But now he finds out that she is dying and he may never speak with her again. And so what he wants to do in the next five minutes is to pour out all his love for his mother that he can. So what does he say? What is important to an adult male when he talks to his mother for the final time? And this was very fascinating to me. Very, very fascinating. He said to her, you know, I appreciate so much 
when, when, when I was young and you would come out with trays of sandwiches and we would sit at a picnic table along the side of the house and all my friends and I would eat those sandwiches. He thanked her for his eighth grade birthday party that he had at home and all the work that she did in decorating the house for him for that birthday party and going through the work at trying to find all his friends to get his friends to the house so they could celebrate together. He thanked her for the gifts that she had given him through the years by Christmas and, and birthdays and just a special time during the week. He thanked her for his lunchbox that he took to school with him. And I remember in my life, those lunchboxes were really important. I don't know what it's like today, but those lunchboxes were really important. He thanked her for all the good meals that she made. He thanked her for those Thanksgiving times when the table was decorated so beautifully and the food was absolutely so wonderful, he could remember almost in his mind each one of those Thanksgiving times. He thanked her as he grew older when she constantly called him and asked him to come over, but he wouldn't. He had better things to do, but he wouldn't come over. But she kept trying and she kept calling. These were the type of things that he spoke about on that phone call. And he was crying through the whole call. I thought that was fascinating. Because what I see from mothers is I see the day-to-day -day work that you do to bless your kids. And I can almost see it in your eyes sometimes where you're wondering, will this ever make a difference? Do they really care about the food that I, create, that I make? And I see that with, with uh, Vivi Cassis and the food that she makes for her family. It is just incredible, and they act like they don't care. But they will care. They will remember those times. And when you try to do special things for your kids, it does make a difference. What were the things that he was remembering? He was remembering all the love that was shown to him as he grew up. He also thanked her for the love that he was able to get from her that he was not able to get from his father. And then he apologized and apologized and apologized for all his behavior throughout his life. And he just cried and he cried. And then the phone call came to an end. And that's the last call he'll ever make to his mother again. Think about that, ladies. Think about that, about what you do every day. Does it make a difference? Oh, yes, it does make a difference. To your sons who are the least expressive, it's different with your daughters. My daughter, I could sit with her and I could talk for an hour straight until I was weary and she wouldn't stop. But with my son, he'd grunt at me occasionally and that was our conversations. And so to have a son come out and express himself in such a way is a treasure that you must always remember. But again, remember that what you do every day makes a difference. But the final thing he said before he left my office was, I want to pray for my mother. How do I pray? And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. See, we often pray diligently when something major is happening in our life. If there is a person in our family who has been injured, we pray diligently. If there is something terrible happening in our life, we will pray and pray and pray. But if life is good, we don't pray. We're all guilty of that, as so am I. My prayer life should, it should be more than what it is today. But in his case, it was a traumatic episode and he wanted to pray, but he wasn't even a Christian. So there was a long ways that we had to go. In other words, he had never developed a relationship with Christ. And how do you develop a relationship with Christ unless you speak to him? 
How do you develop a relationship with your husband or your wife unless you speak to each other? And so that's what prayer is all about, is in developing that relationship. And so in the Bible, as as Pastor Chris spoke about last week, there is something called the Lord's Prayer. And we're going to talk about part of that prayer this morning. But before we begin, I have to do what I often enjoy doing, and that is going into the Bible and explaining to you a couple of different locations where the Lord prayer exists. And the first one is Matthew 6, 9 through 13. Matthew 6, 9 through 13. That is the first place where the Lord's prayer exists in the Bible. And it reads like this. This is then is how you should pray because the apostles were asking Jesus, how do you pray? How do you pray in the manner in which you pray? How do you pray to God? And it said, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. That's the first time that's stated in the Bible. The second time is Luke 11, 2 through 4. Luke 11, 2 through 4. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us. And lead us not into temptation. And so what you see here are the Lord's Prayer, but it's two different ones. They're very similar, but there's a little bit of difference in the two of them. And I would like to give you a general explanation this morning as to why. When you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, what you will find out is that these apostles directed themselves towards a specific type of the population. And for example, Matthew would preach to the Israelites. He would preach to the Pharisees. He would preach to the Sadducees. So when Matthew did this Lord's Prayer, he knew the people in which he was speaking to. And so he knew that they knew how to pray. In other words, they knew how to stand on street corners and to be able to pray in front of others. So it sounds really good but does it really mean anything to them? So they knew how to pray. And so what Matthew wanted to do during the book of Matthew was to reach out to these people and say, yes, you know how to do all those religious things very, very well. But now when you do it, mean it. When you pray, really pray. When you pray to God, really pray to God, but mean what it is. That you say. And then when we take a look at Luke, and a lot of the people who do a lot of research in the Bible believe that that is as close as possible to what Jesus actually said, but Luke wrote to the Gentiles. The Gentiles are us. In other words, they didn't know Jesus until just uh, recently in the book of Luke. And so he wanted to speak to them, to people who don't know how to pray, who have no clue how to pray, don't know what they're saying, and in many cases don't even know who they're talking to. And so that is why he states things in the manner in which he does. Now, for those of you, if you've gone to church before, you will hear the Lord's Prayer in a different fashion. And it goes something like this. I believe in the... And I'm giving you the Apostles' Creed. I don't want to do that. But it goes like this, and he said to them, A Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive those who sit against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. This is, a, this is what is recited in churches throughout the United States. But what it is, is there's add-ons that were put onto the Lord's Prayer later on through the Catholic Church. And in many ways, this is what we're reciting today. Very close to the original, 
but different because of the add-ons up to today. So if you've had the question as to why does it sound so different today in comparison to what's in the Bible, that's why it's the way it is. Now, what we're going to be talking about this morning is the very first part of the Lord's Prayer. And it is, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now, it is a small little statement, but it has a lot to say. When you take a look at that hour, we have to be very understanding of what that hour means. It doesn't say, my Father who art in heaven. It says, our Father who art in heaven. I want to tell you another little story this morning. There was a man, uh, a very popular man by the name of Bill Gaither, and he wrote a lot of music during my time. So people who are of my age who listen to Christian music when they were younger may know who Bill Gaither is. I know there's somebody here who does know him very, very well and likes his music. And so he had an episode occur in his life, and that is a member of his church was working in a garage, using some solvents, really strong solvents, to clean an engine that was located in his garage. And as he was cleaning that engine, the vapors filled up the garage, and he didn't realize what was happening. But he had a furnace up on the ceiling, and in that furnace was an open flame. When the vapors reached that open flame, the garage exploded. And this person was lit on fire, and he burned and he burned. The ambulance came, took him to the hospital, and people within the church were notified that evening that he was not going to live, that too much damage had been done. They were not going to do any more for him. They were going to let him die. This happened the day before Easter. The next day, the congregation all got together, and the congregation didn't really have an exciting Easter because they felt so bad for the family, and they felt so bad for the person who was for surely going to die. At the end of that worship service, the pastor came forward, and he had been with a family uh, throughout the night, He was exhausted, and he looked at everybody in the auditorium, and he said, he's still alive. He is still alive. And if he makes it, you as a congregation are going to have to get involved with the family and help out the family as much as possible because he has a long road ahead of him. And he did survive. And that's what happened is the congregation got together and helped him as much as they could. And when he came home from that worship service, Bill Gaither, he sat at his piano and began playing a tune. And between him and his wife, they put together a song. And the song is the family of God. And this are the words. He says, you will notice we say brother and sister around here. It's because we're a family And these folks are so near. When one has a heartache, we all share the tears and rejoice in each victory in his family so dear. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain. I'm doing it again. I told myself I wasn't going to get emotional this morning. And somehow... It just doesn't work that way. Yes, Mr. Slusher, as you get older, your emotions do come forward. Okay, let me try that again. I am so glad I'm part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join ears with Jesus as we travel this side, for I'm part of the family, the family of God. So when you recite the Lord's Prayer and you start with our, it is not just you, But it is your congregation. It is every congregation within Pembroke Pines. It is every congregation in Florida. It is every congregation that exists in every church throughout the United States. 
It is everybody who believes in Christ throughout the world. And so when you see that that word, our Father, it means that you are reciting this prayer with everybody, every Christian throughout the world. And it is a wonderful thing to feel that with the excitement that runs down your back when you know that there's all these Christians together reciting this prayer. If you think about at the beginning of Luke, and in the beginning of Luke, it talks about when the Holy Spirit came upon the people at that time, and Peter was preaching to all the people that were there. 3,000 people came to Christ. That hour is talking about those 3,000 people that came to Christ. And then another man was allowed and, and it was, it was helped to, to regain his ability to walk. And people crowded around the apostles when this happened, and they wanted to know who Jesus was. And they told him who Jesus was, and 2,000 came to Christ on that day. All those people are part of the hour that we see in the Lord's Prayer. When you take this Bible and you read all the stories in the Bible and you read the how you people have accepted Christ over and over and over and over again, all those people are a part of that hour. Every person that you witness to, every person that comes to Christ because of you, And the work that Christ does in you is part of that hour. When you recite the Lord's Prayer, never say hour without getting this great feeling inside your soul. The second part is Father. Our Father. And I want to take a look at a verse this morning. It's Romans 8, 14 through 17. Romans 8. 8, 14 through 17, and it says, for those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship, and by Him we cry, Abba, Father, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his suffering in order that we may also share in his glory. The New Testament talks so much about how we are God's children, which means that God is our father. If you read the Old Testament, in the Old Testament, God seems like this somewhat distant, angry, uh, difficult God in many different ways. Nobody really in the Old Testament looked at God as being their father. But in the New Testament, things changed so much because in the New Testament, Jesus was our witness. And what we saw Jesus do is he would sit and he would pray and he would go by himself and he would pray often. And what he would pray was our father. He would talk to his father and he would use the term Abba. And what is Abba defined as? More as of daddy. It was a personal relationship that he had with his father. And so many times you will read in the Bible, he would go off to a quiet corner someplace and he would pray to his father, his father. And he spoke to the people of that time saying, you are all children of my father. So therefore, my father is your father. And so we can take a look today and look at God as being our father. And I think that's an exciting thing when we take a look at that. But what I want to do this morning is bring this back a little bit to reality to your day-to-day lives. I know that the relationships that some people have with their fathers is not the best, to say the least. So what happens when you do these kind of messages and you preach these kind of words 
People remember what their dad was like, and that turns them off to the Father in heaven. Oh, man, I can hardly even express to you how important it is for you to be a godly man in front of your children, especially to be a godly man in front of your daughters, because often your daughters will take a look at you, and however you are, that's who the Father in heaven is going to be. So if you're an angry father, the Father in heaven is going to be angry. If you're a mean father, the Father in heaven is going to be mean. But if you're a loving father, then they're going to look at the Father in heaven as being a loving father, and your kids will become closer to God himself. There was a movie that took place several months ago. It's called The Shack. And I'm not going to sit here and express theology, and I'm not going to take a look at it, whether it was a good one or a bad one, but there was a point in there that I wanted to express. And this man had a very terrible thing occur to his daughter in a shack out in the country. Daughter died. And it really changed his life, and he was angry at God. And so he had an experience with the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So when he spoke to God, God was in a form of a woman. Why was God for him in this movie the form of a woman? Because his relationship was so bad with his father that he could not look at a man as his father in heaven. And so in this case, it was a woman that was placed in that position to be able to bring him back to Christ. So always remember that I understand that. I listen to the stories every day of people's relationships with their fathers and relationships with their mothers. And I know that it is not a perfect relationship that people have quite often with their fathers. But remember, Christ is your Father, and he loves you dearly, will always be with you. So do not compare, unless you've got the greatest father in the world. Hopefully my kids feel that way. The next one that I'd like to talk about this morning goes on to who art in heaven. So it's our Father who art in heaven. Now what we often do is become a little less respectful of God than what we should. He's saying, our Father, but he's expressing it, but I'm in heaven. I'm the Father who's in heaven. I'm the one who created the world. I'm the one who created you. I'm the one who can help you in any way that I can according to my will. So don't forget that when you say, my father, yes, but I'm the God who is in heaven. And so when we come to God and we pray to God, we need to be honorable, we need to be respectful, we need to know who it is that we're speaking to. Sometimes when we pray, what we do is we stand and we pray. But what you need to do sometimes is to make believe in your mind that you are coming in front of the throne of God and you're getting down on your knees and you're praying to God. It takes a minute for your mind to adapt to that. And that's okay. If there is a moment of quietness before you pray, That's acceptable. I know that people are sometimes uncomfortable with quietness. It seems awkward. But try to think of that in your mind, of going in front of God, in front of the throne, on your knees to pray. And you're saying, our Father who art in heaven. And then you can go on and pray. But be respectful, be honorable, don't think about him as your, your God in the sky or some other very flippant things that people say. 
about God. So we talk about our Father who art in heaven. So much in that small little bit. And so we're going to go to the next one. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And here you say, see the part where it says, hallowed be thy name. Well, the Jewish people were quite different than what we were when they named their children. They would name their children with meanings that would go on in their life as to what their mission in life might be or what their goal in their life might be. And so the name that they had was very important. It's not like us where we pull out the book and we go through and we say, yep, that's a nice name. Yep, that's a nice name. That's a bad name. I don't want to use that one. Oh, there's a good one. Let's flip a coin and decide which name that's going to be. Okay, maybe it's not exactly like that. But that's sort of what we do in trying to determine the names of people. But back in those days, names were very important. If you take a look at Matthew and you look at all the genealogy of the people, you will see all these names of people. And it was really, really important that people had a name and they could connect it to their father and connect it to their grandfather and connect it going generations back because all of this family attachment as it relates to the name, was really, really important to the Jewish people. And so when you take a look at this particular one about the name of Jesus, if you go into the Bible and you study the Bible and you study the names of Jesus, you'll find out there's many of them, many, many different names. So this morning, I want to read you a little bit from Isaiah 7 through 14 to get this idea as to what it means by hallowed be thy name. Isaiah 7 verse 14, Isaiah was a prophet and six, 700 years before Jesus was even born, he came forward with a prophecy and this is his prophecy. It says, therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign and the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And then we take a look at Matthew 1, 18 through 25. Matthew 1, 18 through 25. And it goes as follows. This is how the birth of Jesus the Messiah came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. And because Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her publicly, Uh, disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. And so they're saying, respect the name, our Father who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. This is, again, our creator. This is the God of our universe This is the person who created us. This is the person who knew before the beginning of time who you were going to be and understood what you were going to be doing in your life. And part of Reformed theology is he knew that you were going to be with him someday in heaven, and that was all planned out before you were even born. Respect the name. Do not swear with that name. Do not say evil things against that name. Do not be flippant in what you say about that name, but be respectful and be honorable with the name of God. I hope now that when you see our God who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, that you take a look at that far differently than what you have ever seen in your life before. I'm going to close in prayer. And what I'd like to do this morning is to give a Mother's Day prayer. When that prayer is done, the music will begin. 
When the music begins, you will have the opportunity to come down here with our prayer warriors and be able to write on this panel the prayer that you have in your soul. Because we as a church want to pray for you. And we want to pray for those things that you struggle with in your life or for those people that you want to see something change in their lives. But during that song, please feel free to be able to come down and the board will be in the corner and you will be able to write on that those particular prayers. So this morning, I'd like to finish with a prayer. And remember that we're doing this according to the standards of the Lord's Prayer. And so what we're going to do is to do it the way that Jesus asked us to do. So this morning, let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Lord, we are excited this morning that we may be praying to you in this auditorium, but we know that there's so many people out there who love you. We know that there's so many people out there that pray to you. We know that throughout this state and throughout this country and throughout this world, we are all together as one. We are Christians, and we pray to you. And Lord, together, we all want to create that relationship with you because that's what these prayers are all about. That's what communication is all about. And Lord, we thank you that we can call you our Father. And maybe sometimes we struggle with that term, but we know what it means. We know what a father should be like, and we know that you're the best father that you could possibly be. Because Lord, we know that you love us, and we want to honor you, and we want to praise you, and we want to glorify you. Because, Lord, you bless us in so many ways, and we want our prayers to be more than just a list of things we want, but to be a time where we can find out who you are, to be able to create that relationship with you. And, Lord, on this Mother's Day this morning, we want to honor our mothers we want to pray for our mothers. So, dear God, we honor our moms today on Mother's Day because you chose them to create each one of us. Lord, for many, Mother's Day is a difficult day. So we ask you to comfort those with heartaches today. For those who lost their mothers, comfort them. For moms who've lost a child through a miscarriage or through death, comfort them. We pray for our stepmoms who struggle with, a, with blending a family. And we pray, pray for those who have a delayed adoption or even a failed adoption and their heart has been broken. Lord, comfort these moms. Comfort those who've wanted to be mothers but it just hasn't happened. Comfort those who struggle with infertility. Wrap your, round, or your arms around these women, dear Lord, and give them your comfort today. At the same time, you've said to rejoice with those who rejoice, so we celebrate with those who have given birth this year to a brand new baby. And we celebrate with those parents who daughters will become a mother for the first time. And we celebrate with those who've adopted children into the home or those who have graciously and warmly welcomed foster kids who need a loving home. Lord, we thank you for our moms in every stage of life. We thank you for the mothers of preschoolers who work is never finished. We thank you for the moms of grade schoolers who play chauffeur and pack lunches and help with homework every day. We thank you for moms who feel the pride and the ache of now being in the emptiness stage. On this Mother's Day, Lord, we commit ourselves to honoring and to loving and to protecting the mothers in our lives. And we thank you for the gift of mothers. 
And we pray your blessing on all of them today. Amen. Thank you.